Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this, the first episode of Live with Littlewood, with me, Mark Littlewood, the Director General of the Institute of Economic Affairs. And joining me this evening is a stellar cast of free market thinkers, journalists, liberal economists, uh, who are going to set the world to right in the next hour and a quarter or so. Basically, think of this as a bumper edition special of Question Time, but just an ultra, ultra sound version of Question Time. That's the treat that you're in for uh, this evening. Uh, Let me start by means of an advertisement. If you're watching us on YouTube, please subscribe to the IEA channel. You can do that by hitting the subscribe uh, icon in the bottom right of your screen. Hit the notification bell as well. The IEA is producing online digital content every single day, and that will mean you don't miss out on any of it. I'd also suggest you go to our website, iea.org.uk. There you can sign up for our free daily uh, email newsletter. That will get you invites to webinars and keep you um, posted of when these sort of live streams happen, as well as all of our online video content. So let me set the scene. Uh, What a bleak, bleak day in Britain. The official numbers suggest that uh, we have now the highest death count in Europe from coronavirus. Uh, A senior scientific advisor to the government has had to quit because he seems to be of the do as I say, not do as I do variety of senior sort of people. Uh, Meanwhile, over in Germany, the shops are beginning to reopen. And uh, most excitingly of all, I'll have the Bundesliga to watch on television before very long, whereas there is no sign of Premier League football coming back anytime soon. It's not just a health emergency, of course. It's an economic emergency as well. And with each passing day, the British economy is suffering, perhaps over the long term, not just the short term. My first three guests to uh, try and uh, help put this right, uh, welcome to you all, are Kate Andrews, the economics correspondent of The Spectator uh, and formerly of the IEA as our Associate Director and Director of Communications. Welcome, Kate. Good evening. Hello. Uh, Tom Harwood, who is a senior reporter at the Guido Fawkes website, who's already written in The Telegraph about uh, how we must make sure that this sort of a liberal authoritarianism does not become the new normal. Good evening, Tom. Good evening. And Sam Bowman, the Director of Competition Policy at the International Centre for Law and Economics. He's also a Senior Fellow of the Adam Smith Institute, having previously served as their Executive Director. Hi, Sam. How are you? Hey, Mark. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Well, a bit depressed, as you might have understood from my introduction. Um, Kate, I'm going to start with you. Uh, You've been covering uh, how the world's been turned upside down for uh, The Spectator. Uh, Why are things apparently so bleak in the United Kingdom? Uh, We seem to be having the worst of all possible worlds, uh, the most authoritarian measures, potentially, if these early statistics are to to believe, uh, the the worst fatality rates. Uh, Meanwhile, Germany and some of Europe seems ready to begin to return to normal. What have we got to learn? Uh, Well, we have a lot to learn, but I would caution a bit on the horrible figures out today. I think it's safe to say that it's not going as well as one would have hoped in the UK. And there's plenty of criticism to bandy about, particularly at government and its policy of uh, creating capacity in the NHS by moving a lot of elderly people into care homes, which has clearly caused havoc there and is one of the main reasons why Britain's death toll is increasing. But we just do need to pause and consider that there are some differences in the way that countries are reporting their statistics. Some are including different um, in-hospital, out-of-hospital deaths. Uh, We also need to look at this in terms of population. If you look at it per every million people in the UK, uh, compared to every millionth person in other countries, you see um, it's not as bleak of a picture, although still not fantastic. So we're not going to know for months, I mean, potentially up to a year, uh, how countries actually fared when it came to their death tolls. I think what's going to be very difficult for the UK, however, is that these headlines aren't good. Uh, Britain, when polled, is one of the most frightened groups of people uh, when it comes to the coronavirus. They really don't want to kickstart the economy, where other countries like Italy and Germany, people have been quite desperate, actually, to get back out there and, and start life again. And so the government has a real problem on its hands. And I think it's one of the many reasons that lockdown restrictions are going to be rolled back slowly. Now, Britain, I'm I'm actually quite hesitant to say it was late 
wait to go into the lockdown. I'm not sure we have enough data to, to confirm that yet either. But it was certainly one of the last countries in Europe to go into lockdown, but not by that much, by about a week or 10 days or so. Now, again, we'll know when we have more data if those were if that was a really crucial period of time, it may have been. But now where Britain's really lagging behind is coming out of lockdown. And in sure. a few weeks' time, it's, it's going to be an outlier from that perspective. Um, we don't have the most draconian measures. Actually, our lockdown has been more of a quasi-lockdown compared to places like Italy, where people were only allowed to go back outside to take a normal walk around the park as of the beginning of this week. So, you know, we have to be careful when we're making these comparisons. But it yeah, isn't... I get it. But the, uh, uh, you're quite right, Kate. And there's lies, damn lies and statistics. I completely agree with that. And uh, there was a statistician I was on the radio with earlier who said, look, really wait till the end of the year until the stats are in. But in your heart of hearts, right, it, it's not going that well here, either in uh, health terms or in terms of getting out of the lockdown. And you'd expect you could have one or the other, right? And it mm -hmm. seems that we've got the rough end of the stick on both. Isn't that what you sort of, you feel inside your bones, even if the statistics aren't perfect yet? I, I, I think the UK has made a huge mistake by shifting the burden from the NHS into care homes, which just didn't have the resources to handle that. And you were taking the most vulnerable people in society and putting them all in one place, many of whom were probably already infected with COVID-19 when they went in. I think in retrospect, we'll see that as a huge mistake. And I also think now because of these headlines, the government's going to be so terrified to roll back lockdown restrictions because a second wave would be, from a PR perspective, so much worse than it may, right. be, may have been a few weeks ago. So, so you're you're uh, thinking it's now it's now a kind of PR war as much as we're following the scientific advice, basically. I think it um, always has been, frankly. Yeah. Um, but okay. perhaps the PR war is not going so well. Uh, Tom, give us some reasons to be cheerful. I'm <laughs> utterly downcast and miserable about the state of affairs. We're losing all of our liberties. Some of us uh, have been unlucky enough to lose our loved ones, and the economy is atrophying. I mean, how the hell do we get out of this? Right. I like to be optimistic in all possible circumstances. So there are some good points here. I mean, firstly, the number of people dying does seem to be slowly going down every single day. That's something to celebrate. Um, obviously, every death is a tragedy, but the trajectory is a good one. Similarly, I think that we shouldn't be taking these polls that are suggesting that everyone's incredibly happy with this lockdown as all that informative. Um, I think they're probably li likely to change pretty quickly um, the longer we're in this. And also we might be seeing this sort of effect that people sort of often um, use when it comes to sort of surveys asking whether you've taken drugs or not. Um, people might not be telling the whole truth, might be wanting to follow social norms appearing to be uh, more uh, altruistic than they perhaps are being, particularly as we saw yesterday evening. Um, so I think that there are, are some glimmers of light. And I think that in some ways, this country is not uh, very happy with being locked down, perhaps less happy than any other country in Europe. We can see by mobility data that people are moving around more and more. Um, we can see by the, the severity of the lockdown in the first place, this is one of the most liberal lockdowns. Yeah. I mean, if we look across to, to Ireland, to France, to Spain, to Italy, they were all much, much harsher in terms of what people were allowed to do. So there is still that sort of burning flame of liberty, I think, within the British people as a whole. And that is just waiting to rear its head. Well, um, OK, there's some reasons to be cheerful, I guess. I mean, I did see some polling data suggesting that it was comparing the UK, the USA, um, Australia and Hong Kong. And it, uh, although the Brits were the most compliant, as you say, Tom, it was a stated preference, not a revealed preference. It's mm. what you say to an opinion pollster, not what you're actually doing. But it does seem it might shift quite rapidly as we come off the peak, right? As people see the number of fatalities fall, do you think people will sort of snap back into, I want to get back to work? I mean, my kind of worry about this is people seem to be enjoying isolation. I mean, for me, this is ghastly socialist house arrest. Uh, but for much of the population, it seems to be kind of quite a nice break, you know, in nice sunny weather. And the government picking up 80% of your wage bill if you're not working. Well, one of the interesting differences, I think, um, was in Ipsos Mir Ipsos Mori's polling, which showed that the age at which people are accepting of the lockdown um, is, is a massive uh, point of variance. Older people, people with families, people um, who are probably more likely to be in 
homes, perhaps with gardens, certainly with loved ones, are much more comfortable in the lockdown for perhaps obvious reasons. Whereas people aged 20 to 30 who might be um, living alone, who are less likely to be uh, with family members, who, uh, are less supportive of the lockdown. Um, and it's it's uh, it's all it's interesting that this might be a point of electoral pressure uh, on the government, particularly younger people wanting not so much to go back to work, but to see friends uh, and to go out and party. Well, yeah, but that's not going to do much for British GDP, is it? I mean, I'm all in favour of people uh, going down the pub and you know and going out to party. Uh, but uh, we do need to get people back to work, right, Tom? And do you think there's any case? I know this was now a couple of weeks ago, but uh, from what I can make of the data. Uh, more or less, I mean, this is a broad sweeping statement. This isn't really killing very many people under the age of 60. It's a very ageist virus. Um, and it tends to be uh, hitting older people hardest and therefore, by definition, hitting economically inactive people the hardest. Do you think we should have some age rule? You know, if you're, if you're in your 20s and your 30s, on your head be it go down the pub if you want go back to work if you want because the risks to the risk of you dying would be low you might get a pretty horrific illness but it seems the fatality rates are really low should we move people back by age cohort yeah i get quite annoyed actually when there are these reports coming up that say oh we've found one 10 year old who's suffered horribly from coronavirus obviously a tragedy and obviously that is one case um that is very sad but it's also an infinitesimally unlikely thing to happen mm -hmm. the younger you are um broadly the thinner you are broadly the more female you are broadly um there are lots of different um ways we could segment this but actually Probably age in terms of social cohesion is the least disruptive way that we could segment something like that. And, and this study from Warwick a few weeks ago now did suggest liberalising things for people aged 20 to 30. That would seem to ease some of those heaviest pressures on the system. Sam Bowman, how the hell do we get out of this? Uh, not uh, what, What's your view on the economics of it? How big a hole are we going to find ourselves in when we finally ease the lockdown? Are we going to be able to bounce back incredibly quickly? Because obviously the infrastructure is still all there. Or are we in for uh, an economic tsunami and years and years of rebuilding, let alone the, the debt that we've just piled on top of ourselves? Um, I think there are probably two factors to answering that. Um, I should say at the beginning, I'm probably relatively optimistic about our um, ability to bounce back. Um, the first factor is um, how much of the economic arrangements before the shutdown have we preserved and i think the uk's approach to uh, support support furloughed workers has been the right one um compared to for example the united states where there's been much more emphasis on unemployment support and the reason that i think the uk support is the uk approach is better is that it preserves those economic arrangements so if you think about a holiday town in off season or if you think about <clears throat> most of france in the middle of the summer um, the economy doesn't go into a long recession after that period ends because all of the economic arrangements like the employment contracts and things like that have already been um, set up and they're preserved. And if we do that in the UK, and to, to a large extent we are doing that in the UK, then when things go back to normal, um, that's that we should really be able to return to the, that kind of period before. The question is, how long is this period, first of all, a shutdown would last for? And then how long is the period of purgatory? The sort of in-between um, after the lockdown is over, but before we can go back to normal. And um, how, how substantial is that purgatory? Um, sure. Some countries, I mean, places like Hong Kong and South Korea uh, have responded with lots of testing. Uh, Hong Kong doing lots of um, social distancing, mandatory quarantine measures, things like that. Hong Kong is um, really getting close to uh, back to normal in terms of people being able to do the things that they want to and businesses being able to operate the way they want to. Uh, I don't have a lot of optimism about the UK's ability to manage things in the way that the Hong Kong or South Korean governments have. Um, I think that we've been pretty disastrous so far. And I think that um, I, I will come out and say I think the UK did the lockdown way, way, way too late. And I think that um, there will be many, many questions to answer about why we, we were so late in doing that lockdown. And Sam, I think because I just... of that, it's going to be it's going to end up being quite a painful period to come out. And that's where the, the bite could be. Sam, I just want to come back to you on this point of comparing the, the sort of furlough or the unemployment schemes in the US <clears> and the UK, because I hear what you're saying, but isn't there a danger on our side of the pond that we're sort of trying to preserve every business and every job that existed in March 2020 in ASPIC? And actually, the impact of uh, this virus could be to radically change working patterns, radically change businesses. And one argument that I've heard 
is uh, the US might be able to deal with it better because rather than trying to, you know, uh, chain people to previous jobs, working in pubs, clubs and bars, for example, there will be an unemployment queue, but that allows the reallocation of labour where it's most needed more rapidly. And in the UK, we just seem to be determined to dial back to wherever we were in mid-March 2020. The, the, the economy may well have moved on by then. Its needs might be very different and, and we might be a bit sort of frozen, no? No, I don't think that that's um, a significant danger. Um, I think that we, I mean, economies are very good at adapting to real changes in circumstances. And I don't think it matters that much if we wait six months or eight months to do that after, um, if it does turn out, for example, that people want to work from home more. Um, and I'd be pretty surprised if there was such a significant change in people's working patterns that um, we did need to make a really sh quick change. Um, and also the furlough scheme, the way it works, is um, pretty accommodating to that. Because if you're a furloughed worker, you are legally allowed to take another job. So um, mm. if, for example, Amazon is trying to hire new workers to be delivery people, um, furloughed workers can do those jobs and still get money from the furlough scheme. So there's a, quite a lot of money on the table for people who are in that situation. So I don't think there's much about the furlough scheme that's stopping people from doing new jobs. And I think that there's a lot that we would want to do to make sure that all of the businesses that were solvent in April, or sorry, solvent in February, um, that would be solvent if nothing had ever changed and will be solvent once we get a vaccine for this. I think we yeah. want to be really, really, really careful that we don't lose those businesses because entrepreneurship is a very, very difficult thing. And the process of discovering which business arrangements are valuable is very, very long. And so it's that um, so losing those means we would take very, very, very long time to rediscover sure. the valuable patterns that have been lost. So I think that's a much bigger danger than um, yeah. the kind of flip side of that. You don't know, I want to come back to Kate in a minute to tell us which countries we should be looking to for inspiration, but Sam, you don't know if there's any evidence of the furlough scheme being gamed to you. It does seem from the face of it, because the one rule is if you're <laughs> furloughed, you can do whatever you want other than lifting a finger to help your in present company. So you could furlough all of the Guido Forks team, put them on the spectator, furlough all of the spectator team, get them to work for the IA, furlough all the IA, get them to work for the Adam Smith Institute, and so on. The government can pay for all of it. Everyone's a winner, right? Um, I guess so. I don't know why, why that would be in the employer's interest, because I would imagine that um, Tom is probably the best of all of us at working for Guido Fawkes. I'd imagine that you are probably the best of all of us at working for the IA and so on and doing your job for the IA, at least. And um, the I, so, I, so I think that I'm sure there are some people gaming it. Um, any, any well, the difference is the government would pick up the bill rather than well, rather than but, the but, company. But the well, the company. The company um, still needs to have a reason. I mean, you, you, if you were going to work for Guido Fawkes, Guido Fawkes would have to give you something to work for Guido Fawkes, right? So it's not completely free for Guido Fawkes. It's also probably, um, I mean, I don't know, I, maybe there are things like that. But I think that we should worry a lot less about spending too much money compared to the risk of spending too little. This is a very, very okay. unusual recession, and it's much, much worse to undershoot the amount of money we should be spending and under and, and lose really valuable economic arrangements than it is to spend a little bit too much money. Remember, it's just transfer payments. So it's just sure. money being borrowed from one part of society, basically from the future to another part. And that's much less economically costly than most government spending in a recession where we're trying to build new railway yep. lines or build new roads to nowhere sure. and things like that. Um, just to be clear to anybody watching on YouTube, particularly the uh, Who Funds You campaigners, just want to reassure you we haven't used the furlough scheme in that way at the Institute of Economic Affairs. So we're still entirely funded by our own donors rather than furloughing staff to other companies. We haven't gained the system, although we have put a couple of staff on furlough. Kate, where should we be looking to in the world for <clears throat> some inspiration in these dark times? Who's got it right? I know it's going to be a mixed picture. Nobody's hit the bullseye, yeah. but uh, who's come closest? Well, yeah, but I mean, there are some standouts. Uh, countries in Asia were significantly more prepared for this kind of pandemic because they had to deal with SARS in a way that the West didn't. Uh, they set up their all of their planning and all of their schemes to deal with a respiratory infection like coronavirus, whereas we were preparing for flu. So if you look to countries like Hong Kong and South Korea, Sam noted, especially with their track and trace schemes, they really have seemed to get a balance right where, you know, big parts of the economy had to be shut down for a small period of time. But throughout this whole process, uh, people's lives haven't been put on hold in the same way. And now we're going to look to countries like Australia that are going to try to replicate something very similar to the track and trace schemes uh, in, in Hong Kong and, and, and South Korea. Um, and we'll see if they get it 
it right. I think looking at the comparison between Denmark and Sweden is really interesting. So Sweden's been in the news a lot because obviously they they didn't bring in the mandatory lockdown that we've seen elsewhere. I would argue if you have Italy on one side and Sweden on the other, the UK is actually probably just about in the middle. Um, and the projections for Sweden and the death toll there just haven't proven to be true. I think they're still under 3,000 deaths and Imperial thought they could be between 20 and 40,000. That being said, they are still, they've brought in a lot of social distancing measures. So it's not to say they're going about their normal activity. Countries like Denmark have been, um, have had a death toll that is, is slightly lower, but they locked down completely. Still though, they've started sending young children back to school. So I think, you know, I, I'm becoming more and more frustrated with the UK's slow approach to unrolling the lockdown, or at least unveiling the roadmap, which apparently we're going to see at the end of this week. One benefit of it, however, is that you do get to look to other countries, especially in Europe, to see what's going right and what's going wrong. There's been a bit of a wobble in Germany, but they haven't had to, to shut down again. Um, and then, I mean, I think the US is going to be one to watch. Not I mean, We'll know soon if, if we can learn from it or not. Um, as Sam says, because they didn't furlough, they didn't bring in a furlough scheme and they just did a, a one-off um, payment to people. Uh, people have been losing their jobs in masses. I think it's it's one in five members of the U.S. labor force now yep. is currently unemployed. So states are pushing to reopen and states are pushing to reopen when it's clear they haven't hit the peak of the virus yet. So the U.S. Okay. is going to be a really interesting example where they're reopening and they're still dealing with the virus in a very real way. Definitely one to watch. Uh, but obviously, very different in different states, right? I mean, New yeah. York City, rather different to like rural Wyoming, right? I mean, huge, so huge different. Uh, variants there. Um, uh, Tom, I'll come back to you in just a second before I welcome our next guest in. And please, you, you three stay with us. There's going to be plenty more to discuss as the as the hour rolls on. Uh, but Kate, give me a sense of Sweden. Give, give them a mark out of 10. I mean, they've been the most liberal country, or at least <laughs> I have been the law. My Swedish friends were putting to me that Social distancing at bus stops and in bars and restaurants has been uh, standard Swedish social practice for decades. They didn't really <laughs> right. need a new, a new government law in order to enforce them to do that. They're very standoffish well, people anyway. A high proportion of people in Sweden already live by themselves. Arguably, it mm. is a country that is that is more able to take on these social distancing measures without being required to. I mean, the way they've actually done it, I think you can give them quite a high mark. It's a bit random. Let's give them eight out of 10. That doesn't mean that that's directly comparable to the UK, though, and that the measures sure. that were used in Stockholm could have worked in London, for example. So it's not to say they got it right and we got it wrong. Um, I, I would say, however, though, that the, the trust in the public mentality is going to matter at some point in the UK. There's always going to be that moment of risk. Uh, and this government is going to want to put that off as long as possible. But I do think that the chancellor has already started talking about rolling mm -hmm. back the furlough scheme. When more and more people are at risk of losing their jobs, I think they are going to want to be trusted more and more to take that risk. Okay, Can I uh, just jump in on the Swedish point, just really quickly? Yeah, what's your um, mark out of 10 for them, Sam? How, how many marks? Um, oh, score well, out of 10. Score for the Swedish government is 1 out of 10. Score for the Swedish people is 7 out of 10. Um, the, the reason is the Swedish government's plan was to get herd immunity. Um, and that hasn't happened because the Swedish people have more or less done voluntary social distancing. Right. Um, they still had way more deaths. They still had six times more deaths than Denmark um, with only double the population. Um, if we were if we did that, we'd be looking at something like 100,000 deaths in the UK by now. Um, so it's not, but, the, but the Swedish government, let's be clear, thought that this was going to be a much less deadly disease than it actually is. Um, and were willing to put into harm's, into harm's way the entire Swedish population to get herd immunity, as our government was as well, until basically popular opinion stopped them. So I think so the government made sounds, a big mistake, but the like, people have been great. Sounds like uh, yeah, another government that urgently needs a change of electorate, right? But if I may very quickly, I think it's important to remember that the lockdown that we have now in the UK is not as strict as people have interpreted it to be. So the, 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 the line is, do not go to work if you can work from home. If you cannot work from home, go to work and socially distance. And in many ways, we've seen the UK react similarly to the way that the Swedes did, that most people are like, no, not going to work at all. We are going to shut businesses down. We are going to furlough staff. But Sam, I, 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 I would give them a bit more credit. I think there is something to be said about knowing your own people and knowing how they're going to react. The Brits have actually reacted in a way that is more extreme than I would have thought. Now, perhaps that you know that will have proven in, in six months time to have saved many more lives and that will have been a fantastic mm -hmm. thing but the way that it's panned out in Sweden I would say is an interesting model to look to especially as at some point we are going to have to leave our homes and start trusting people sure. to do the right thing. Totally. Uh, Tom, I'll come the to, Swedish I'll... government didn't know that that was going to happen. 
I totally agree government's with you. Really, the government's government really know what's going to happen. Tom, very quickly, in one word, your mark out of 10 for Sweden. Stay on the line for us, Tom, and then I need to bring in two more guests. What would you give them out of 10? Uh, are they the great last liberal country in the world, aren't they? I think it's too early to say I'm going to absolutely cop out. But what I would say is international comparisons in a year from now are going to be so, so interesting. One yeah. thing that we haven't mentioned is the difference between Northern Ireland and Ireland, which entered into lockdown at very different times, but have similar rates of death. OK, uh, let me bring in two more guests. I am really delighted to be joined by uh, my good friend John O'Connell, who's the chief executive of the Taxpayers Alliance. Uh, John, welcome. And um, Christian Nemitz, who is the head of political economy at my very own uh, Institute of Economic Affairs. Uh, welcome to you both, gentlemen. Uh, John, I might actually start with you and uh, come back to the panel for what is basically a maths question. So let's see... Uh, uh, which of you are fastest uh, on your feet for mathematics? The question is, how many furloughed workers could we support if we scrapped HS2? Uh, <laughs> you're, you're the chief executive of the Taxpayers Alliance, John, so you, you fight the battle to keep taxes down. Uh, my God, you're going to have one hell of a battle in your hand going forward, aren't you? Government spending is going through the roof. Uh, even projects like HS2 seem to be going ahead. Are you as pessimistic as I am about the short and medium term future of the UK? A few weeks ago, I felt optimistic we could get out of this fast. But it seems now we're going to have high debt, big state involvement, huge state projects. And presumably with that, the thing you campaign against most, higher taxes. Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, Boris Johnson today was talking about the A word, austerity. And um, of course, when people talk about austerity now, they obsess about it. They, they, they only mean spending reduction. They don't mean tax increases, where, of course, tax increases are very much a part of an austerity mix. And so if Boris Johnson wants us to not discuss the A word, we'd very much encourage him to not discuss tax increases as part of the economic recovery. But um, there are questions about whether there's um, the capacity within the economy to increase taxes all that much anyway given that we're going to be struggling coming out of um, coronavirus. I, I'm like you, Mark. I, I did think that we were going to bounce back relatively quickly. I'm less sure of that now. Um, I think that we uh, need to move to a phase where um, lockdown is eased, and which we're going to do next week, which is all great. But I think that we need to be doing it um, with a, a signal to business that, that they're not going to get clobbered by tax increases. So, um, you know, you look at um, measures such as uh, the government pausing cuts to corporation tax. They could look again at that um, particular measure. There were measures on entrepreneurs relief in the budget um, and other such measures that they could possibly revisit. But, um, you know, I say that as a eternal, naive optimist. I'm, I'm sure taxes, um, tax increases will be very much on the agenda. What shape they take is quite interesting. Um, you know, some sort of wealth tax um, uh, is probably going to be high up that list. But um, yeah, it, it's not encouraging when Boris says that A word uh, it, it, you know, is not to be discussed. Uh, I think that spending restraint will be um, quite important, actually, um, you know, um, over the coming five year cycle. Uh, OK, and I'm delighted uh, to be joined by Christian Nemitz as well. Christian, a very, very good evening to you. Uh, it seems from the reports I'm reading, uh, why did you ever leave Germany? Your, your home country seems to have got it bang on right. I know you're not into, as fo into football as much as I am, but like, the Bundesliga is going to start up again. And uh, so Germany seems to, I might ask the other panellists for their marks out of 10 for Germany, but I mean, they seem to be pretty much uh, close to top of the pile for me. But one of the questions that's coming on YouTube, uh, and this gets us into NHS territory and something that Tom was saying about uh, we might not have all the stats yet, but in the fullness of time, comparisons amongst different European countries will be possible. What have we learned about the German healthcare system and how that's coped with the crisis as compared to the UK healthcare system, Christian? Appreciating its early doors on the numbers and we haven't got all the perfect measurements and we might, not be, we might be comparing apples and pears. But tell us a little about what's gone right in Germany, particularly with regard to healthcare. Well, it does seem to help that uh, they have a much more decentralized uh, political setup generally. For example, on Saturdays, I go to a virtual pub now with people I know from, uh, from, from university, from Berlin. And when I ask them about lockdown policies, policy responses to the coronavirus, uh, they all give me different responses. That's because they live in different states. And there's a lot of uh, state by state variation in terms of how they've responded to the crisis. 
prices. And it's not just random variation. I don't mean this in a sense of postcode lottery, but um, there seem to be good reasons for the variation that exists uh, in the sense that, for example, Berlin has gone for a relatively strict approach, very much like Britain. Whereas parts of the Southwest, uh, Baden-Württemberg has gone for a much more liberal approach, more almost comparable to Sweden. That seems to be a sensible thing to do because uh, Baden-Württemberg is, is a place which doesn't have big cities, so lower population density, and they have higher levels of social capital. That is a place where I think people can be broadly trusted to do the right thing anyway. Berlin is a place where that is definitely not the case. So the, the sort of policy variation that you get makes sense. And that is something that uh, we don't have here. You can't tell me that the appropriate policy response for central London is also appropriate for the Welsh countryside. Now, as for the healthcare system in particular, it's, it's not uh, any specific policy responses that were taken in response now to this crisis. It's just that that is a healthcare system which is generally much more uh, decentralized and has a much greater involvement of, uh, of of the private sector. I mean, in, in the hospital sector in particular, about 60% is private. Uh, it's not that somebody has deliberately taken the decision to involve private laboratories in the testing process. It's more that that would be the default setting. They would have to specifically try to restrict that if they had wanted to go for something like what we had here with Public Health England initially doing all the testing right. and all actively involving other actors. Okay. Uh, now, Tom, you made the point uh, that you said that the comparative data and uh, when Kate was at the IA, and I'm sure uh, since, I know the Spectator has always been keen on this idea of, you know, learning from the best. The NHS that used to be a national religion, now it's a national obsession, isn't it? I mean, there's going to be no amount of data that might persuade people that we should change any element of healthcare in Britain, even if the German system or the Swiss system was proven to be a much better way of dealing with it. Uh, do you think that's now completely ossified as something that uh, can't be changed for generations ahead in any size, shape or form, Tom? No, I, th I think that's completely wrong. I think people absolutely, um, in many, many ways, rightly, revere the NHS in this country. But by the NHS, they don't mean the specific bureaucratic system that we have. They mean the idea of universal health care, and they mean the doctors and nurses who work within it. Now, if there were a different way to provide universal health care... Yeah people, I think, would be receptive to it. What people don't like is the idea of having to pay for healthcare or the idea that poor people might not be able to uh, access healthcare. Now, that I don't think is on the table in in any shape or form. But the idea that we can't learn things from Germany or even learn things from our ramp up of testing when we finally decided to involve universities and charities and the private sector, that is something that we have to learn from because it has massively increased uh, our capability to deal with the virus and respond to it in a way that um, this sort of over-centralisation in so many aspects of our response to this virus has been so severely lacking for so long. So uh, now, Kate, you're a calm, comparative kind of gal. Uh, how uh, optimistic are, are you that when these data sets are a bit more um, uh, conclusive, that we'll be able to learn the best practice from across Europe? I mean, I appreciate it's the best practice dealing with a rather extraordinary thing. Uh, or are we just in the land of emotion? Tom seems to strike a, a more optimistic note than, uh, than my uh, miserable prognosis since the start of the programme. I think my lack to, my lack of optimism probably comes from years of um, trying to highlight, as you say, Mark, how uh, mainland Europe does healthcare differently from the UK, certainly not the US, um, and uh, it you know, just the, the reaction that you receive, Christian knows it, Sam knows it, jo everyone on this phone call knows what happens. Um, if you try to make a very legitimate comparison between healthcare systems and you in any way suggest that the NHS is not at the top of that list. Um, so I'm not convinced based on previous experience and certainly not now that there's loads of appetite for change. That being said, I do think a few things could change. Um, and one of them would be that probably for the first time in a very long time, 
And people have really been woken up to the fact that not everybody else in Europe or the rest of the developed world has the NHS, that the way that Italy and Germany and France and Denmark and Sweden operate their healthcare systems is different. And I wonder if perhaps there will be scope in the future, and I don't want to be too optimistic about this, that when you do talk about these differences, it becomes harder and harder to point a finger and say, well, you're only talking about the US. Uh, Because I think a lot of members of the public now are very aware that Germany Mm -hmm. has done things differently, even if they don't know the details of that. And I think that's encouraging. And I also think it will become harder for people who know very well that we're not talking about the United States to keep using that as the stick with which they beat us. Um, Because we all just locked down and changed our lives and made a lot of sacrifices for the sake of keeping other people alive. And that shouldn't stop at COVID. That should apply to cancer patients, stroke patients, patients with diabetes, patients across the board. And if it really is so politically incorrect to ask how Germany is doing with those kinds of patients as well as COVID cool. patients, then I think they're being a bit hypocritical in their approach. Uh, well, Kay, ever the masochist, aren't you? The two countries you've chosen to live in, the UK and the USA, <laughs> probably have the worst healthcare systems anywhere in the Western world. So, Sam, what 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 are your um, thoughts, uh, <clears throat> if you can unmute yourself, on what whether there'll be an appetite for comparison, um, you know, potentially on healthcare systems or what worked or, you know, which furlough or unemployment or welfare schemes worked? Do you think there'll be an appetite for that? Or do you think there'll just be a kind of finger pointing blame and a kind of irrational rage um certainly on health i'm much much less optimistic than anybody here in my opinion we should just give up on health forget about it don't spend any more time it's a waste of time we're pissing in the wind and um you can never convince anybody and you just cut your losses on that one um it's as if you know we were arguing for abolishing the army or something like that which some of them, I don't, but some libertarians want to do. It's well, actually, an upcoming IEA pamphlet. Um, um, oh, well, there you go. Great. Well, no, I just... ever, the, ever the optimists, ever the optimists. Um, I, the, 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 best, the, the biggest problem I can see with the health service is that at elections, it becomes an amazing, uh, and, I'm, and I'm not a particularly strong conservative or anything like that. I, in fact, haven't voted for them very often in my life. But it becomes this amazing um, stick with which to beat uh, certain political parties, even though they really, I mean, they they wanted to go away. Um, they, I mean, the Conservative Party don't want the NHS to be reformed. I wish they did, but they don't. Um, so I think that the, what I would do if I were the government would be to try, try to um, depoliticize the NHS by basically separating it out and pe- pretty much saying the NHS is a bit like the Queen. Um, it's not a political issue. We're not going to have, we're not going to really have government involvement in it. We're going to have a completely separate structure. Maybe we'll have national referendums to appoint the director of the NHS or whatever. Um, but just just try to pull it out of politics altogether. And for people like us, we just focus on things like planning, uh, trade, you know, things like that, that we actually can move the dial on. Um, because otherwise, I think we're just going to waste a lot of time and um, lose a lot of friends. Uh, John, let me come back to you because you sort of implied in your, um, you know, in your heart, your uh, naive optimist but in your head you can see everything going wrong i wanted to give you one <coughs> rational uh you know straw in the wind which might be good news for those of us who think that government spending's got out of control don't you think that when we exit this the the cupboard will be somewhat bare uh you know we will have plowed the country way back into debt that de- god only knows what the deficit will be this year uh that pulling the lever of extra government spending to stimulate the economy uh, might not be the obvious lever to to reach for. And do you think some projects that are apparently green lit, such as HS2, which came up earlier, uh, might now actually uh, face cancellation? I needs must. And so, some of the projects that you at the TPA and we at the IEA have been highly sceptical about, is there any? Is it easier to get those projects onto the chopping block now? Well, um, the IVR reckon the uh, the deficit in twenty. 20- uh, 2020, 2021 will be 273 billion. So just to fill that gap for you, Mark. Um, I, I'm not sure about HS2. I think that's a done deal now. I think that um, behind all of this is the government's leveling up agenda. They see HS2 as part of it. And I, I'm, you know, as much as um, I'd love to keep campaigning on it, and I think it's the, you know, scrapping it would be a great thing. Um, I think we've, we, we, we've probably lost that one now. Um, I do think that that political imperative um, of, um, Boris Johnson and his team of levelling up, uh, you know, get Brexit done and all that kind of stuff. That's still in the background. That's still percolating. 
I don't think this necessarily changes that all that much. Um, you know, it just it just means that probably they've got a bigger checkbook to work with in that leveling up agenda than they previously had. But um, HS2 specifically, uh, I'm not particularly optimistic. 25% chance that of getting it scrapped. Okay, but that's probably got up a little, right? Um, that's probably gone yeah, up a little possibly. from 0%. Christian, um, uh, you, you've, you've um, signaled notes of kind of Germanic pessimism uh, over the last few weeks about where this is all going to lead, uh, leave free market liberalism. Do you have any, do you think there are any straws we can cling on to? Is there, is there anything that, you know, ticks the optimistic box reasons? Um, uh, I mean, Henry Wickham asked on YouTube, um, saying I'm pretty sceptical about the lockdown, I am now, but might this actually be a force for kind of creative destruction, um, actually making us rethink the economy? And might there be some upsides of that? Or are we all on, as market liberals, are we all on defence and, and just, you know, hoping that things don't spiral into full-blown authoritarianism forevermore? Maybe we're two-thirds of the way down the road to serfdom already. Well, I thought uh, Germanic pessimism had been my brand for years rather than weeks. But on, on this particular issue, I'm actually, uh, oddly enough, I think a bit more optimistic than most of you. I know I'm normally the pessimist in, in the office. I'm, I'm always the one who says uh, we're going to hell in a handcart. But uh, in this particular case, I don't really buy the idea that we're getting accustomed to authoritarianism because of this. I, I think there is a big difference here uh, that, that people see this really as an emergency situation, but that uh, the measures adopted are not going to uh, spill out into normal times again. It would be more like if I'm on a sinking ship, I'm happy to go along with whatever the, uh, the the captain and the crew tell me to do because I would assume that those people know better how to handle a situation like that than, than I do. But that doesn't mean that once we're back on land uh, that I want to continue them following me around and, and telling me what to do. And uh, even in the in the survey responses that yesterday there has been a high degree of, of approval and it seems to be quite unquestioning. And we, we've also seen, we've also had all these anecdotes of uh, people reporting on their neighbors. Uh, here's someone who's going out too much. Uh, I'm, I'm, pretty, I'm sure my neighbor has had his, his ration of exercise already and so on. But that's, I think, not an appetite for uh, the state running your life. It's more that this is, uh, the lockdown is seen as a collective effort, and therefore these people who don't follow the rules are seen as the equivalent of queue jumpers. Yep. So this is about reciprocity. It's more the attitude is, I am prepared to go along with it if you do as well. I will if you will. And therefore, there is this quite ferocious response if somebody doesn't play by the rules. But that is going to dissipate quickly uh, once uh, the restrictions are lifted and we're approaching something like normal times again. I think that the big difference with the, uh, a road to serfdom situation is that um, that after the Second World War and, and the First World War, the measures that were brought in already had advocates before. So if you think about rent controls that were brought in during the First World War and then stayed um, for until the 1980s, that was more a case where there had always been people advocating rent controls. Now they were suddenly there, and then you could make a case for keeping it that way. But as far as I'm aware, there's no one who says we should permanently furlough a large percentage of the workforce or uh, let alone um, put place everyone under house arrest. It's just that the responses are too specific to the situation. Sure. They couldn't spell, spill over into normal times. And especially um, something, something like subsidies, emergency loans for private companies, uh, that's not going to go down well, uh, but particularly with with, with socialists, uh, the sort of people Hayek was uh, uh, talking about when he wrote to, uh, wrote the road yeah. to serve them. And um, no, I, I don't think there will be much appetite for okay. for any. You're of quite us. right. You're quite right, Christian, to say that you have been the most pessimistic person at the IEA for a good number of years as your brand, but also the most accurate. So uh, that's a little bit worrying. I just want to, uh, before I introduce two more panellists, uh, with our initial three, Tom, Sam and Kate, just to ask you in a number and a sentence uh, how optimistic or pessimistic you're feeling about freedom and prosperity in the UK over the course of the next two to three years. That's the kind of timeline, not the next two to three weeks and not necessarily the next generation. The next two to three years where one is uh, we're going to end up as North Korea. 
uh, and 10 is uh, classical liberal utopia is just around the corner. Uh, give us your number and your explanation. Sam, I'll start with you, then Tom, and then Kate. Eight. I think um, this crisis isn't going to have significant long-term impact on our culture, on our lives, on our politics. We're going to have a difficult year. We'll bounce back from it and things will go back to normal. Tom. I think we're on a solid eight as well, but only if we take the opportunity after the crisis to argue for the kind of policies that will enable our economy to bounce back faster, for the tax cuts, for the liberalisations. This is our opportunity and we should take it. Kate. I'm going to give it a five uh, because I think we're going to be living with a lot more debt, but we might be living with a lot less regulation mm-hmm. business. And I think overall things are probably going to balance out uh, to be as freedom maximizing as they were before, but it won't look the same. OK, good. I'm glad you didn't give an eight, Kate. It was, about, it was beginning to sound like an episode of Radio 4's Today programme where everybody agrees with each other. So, <laughs> uh, uh, so I, was, I was pretty pleased to see at least some note of discontent there. Uh, Sam, Kate and Tom, thank you very much to all of you for your contributions. Do uh, stay with us if you'd like to, but we're going to welcome a, uh, another couple of guests uh, into the conversation. Delighted to be welcomed by Matt Kilcoyne uh, of the Adam Smith Institute, uh, Uh, a close ally of the IEA, who we work with closely, and Tom Clockerty, previously of the Adam Smith Institute and the Cato Institute across the pond, and now at our good friends at the Centre for Policy Studies. Um, Welcome to you both, gentlemen. Matt, I want to start with you, because uh, the ASI have come up with some interesting proposals, I think, just uh, yesterday, was it? Uh, Certainly this week, on how you think we should approach uh, exiting lockdown. Uh, I'll make sure that uh, we a link to that in the live chat on YouTube. But can you tell us a little about what the ASI's proposals were, how you see a sensible liberal way of of navigating out of this problem? So as far as we, we're sort of looking at the restrictions that the government has put on uh, private companies as well as public companies um, of of the public sector, um, and looking at sort of fundamental guidelines as to how the economy should reopen and how public services should reopen. Um, And we're looking at sort of four basic areas more broadly as we look at a series of papers through the next uh, couple of months. Um, The the first four are sort of transactions, investment, employment and civil liberties. Um, Now, we know that the government is looking at some physical ways in which you can operate in shops and in factories and in their schools. um, And that's sort of a, a real sort of a lot of the restrictions that they put are physical restrictions. You know, you can't have more than a number of certain people in a shop um, if, it, if it's a supermarket and so on. Um, and they've gone to the unions and they've gone to businesses and they've asked them, how should um, we reopen? How should you reopen? What restrictions would you like um, in order to make sure that workers are safe, but also that workers want to go back to work um, and that customers feel safe when they're there and they go back to them. Now, um, you know, from a pure libertarian point of view, you might sit there and say, well, businesses know this. Actually, businesses know how to make their workers feel safe and they know how to make their customers feel safe. And if they don't, then they don't deserve to survive and all that kind of stuff. And, that, and I have a lot of sympathy with that. Mm-hmm. Um but there's a, there is a discussion that's going on with government, and we know that they're going to come out with a number of recommendations. So we threw one into the mix, um, which is something that the Weizmann Institute in Israel came out with, which is a cyclical um, two-week cycle over which you go into work for four days, or you go into school for four days, and then you're off for 10 days. And that follows the infection cycle of this particular virus, and therefore mm-hmm. helps to cut the infection, whilst also making sure that about 40% of the population, as a, you know, uh, the people are getting forty percent of their um, of what they would usually be doing back into back into. So you retain some level of economic productivity rather than the, yeah. the full the full. While still then. shielding those people who are vulnerable, um, so you 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 allow the economy to reopen in a certain respect, um, but also allow the public health goal to be met. Um, and that is actually still that is actually underway. A number of companies already do this, of course, with shift patterns. A number of companies have instituted shift patterns with their key workers, like newspapers, for example, obviously uh, work along this pattern already. Um, yeah. But we're also seeing it in the public sector across Europe. So we're seeing in in Denmark, it already in place for primary schools. They've split their classes into two: half go in one week, half go in the next week, um, and they never meet over a two-week cycle. Okay. Um, and then we're also seeing it coming in in parts of Germany and Austria as well. Um, but like, the, but more importantly, we're going to be looking at, like, we know that the government has put restrictions on transactions. We know that it's put restrictions on, uh, it already puts in uh, with taxation restrictions on capital flow, inflows, um, 
and 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 uh, title transfers and licenses um, and we're going to be saying actually you want these things to be increased so how can we remove the restrictions on those the costs on those that government imposes sure. to make sure that the economy boosted as we come out of this crisis and on a on a scale of one to ten how optimistic are you that the government will listen they've been pretty liberal so far so um i would say i would say there's a, there's a good scope for six or seven six ah, and a half. nice nice tom what do the cps want us to do pilot our way out of this absolute nightmare and back to freedom health and prosperity i know you've got the answer finally right, the well. silver bullet tom Thanks for giving me such an easy one, Mark. Uh, <laughs> um, look, I mean, I'm the, the head of tax at the Centre for Policy Studies. And so, of course, I'm going to say that uh, when we're able to exit lockdown and when the economy is in a position to bounce back, the public health crisis is abated somewhat, tax reform should be the priority. And I think, I think that is one of the priorities. Um, you know, I, I, I put, put it like this in a way. Um, for those of us who are libertarians or libertarian-leaning, this crisis has been extremely difficult because I think the right policies have been ones that cut completely against our instincts. Um, I think lockdown and the loss of liberty that entails was the right thing to do. I think borrowing and spending vast sums of money in this very peculiar circumstance was the right thing to do. So it, it, it's a weird situation for us to find ourselves in, quite an uncomfortable one. I do think, though, that as we move to the recovery phase, maybe there's a chance that we come into our own. And our, our ideas and our principles have a sort of a, a renewed relevance and purpose. Because to me, the one big change I think we have to have in British political discourse and in the direction of policymaking in this country is for people in Westminster to stop thinking that economic growth is something that just happens to them and they respond to. You know, look, in this very specific pandemic situation, maybe that is how it's been. But for a long time, we failed to have a pro growth policy. Um, and we've sort of accepted very lacklustre rates of growth for a long period of time and not really done anything about it. So I think this is going to be an opportunity and actually a, a significant need for pro-growth tax reform, um, for sensible regulatory reform. Uh, and, you know, a couple of specifics. I mean, I think on tax reform, I could talk endlessly on that. I'm sure you don't want me to. But basically, uh, we need to take the burden of taxation off business investment in all its forms. Um, and if we need to make up any lost revenue, um, then we should think about broadening our consumption tax base. We should think about sensible taxes on pollution, on congestion, things like that. I think on the regulation side, um, for every country responding to this crisis, the, the, the thing they need to do on deregulation is going to be different, different. But for us, let's face it, planning reform. We've needed it for years, probably decades. Uh, I think we're going to need it now more than ever. Um, but if we can put together those things, tax reform, regulatory reform, and a sort of policy maker commitment to growth as a central organizing principle of government, um, I think something reasonable might come out of this. Something reasonable might come out of it. There you go. That's about the most optimistic note we've had. Uh, 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 chiming in this conversation. John, I want to come back to John O'Connell because tax um, was on the agenda there. John, I was uh, uh, back in the day on the TPA's um, tax commission um, and uh, you, you produced a, an absolutely comprehensive proposal for how we could simplify the tax system. I wonder if you could pick up on Tom's point and you'll need to put your mic back on um, to do so. Um, that uh, Might there actually be an appetite for uh, sort of the government saying, well, you know, having come out of this pandemic, the economy's on the floor, debt is terrible, go for growth has to be the overall government strategy, sort of throw policies our way that will increase GDP growth. That is the ace of spades in terms of working out what cards we're going to play. And do you think you might be able to pick that tax commission report and the huge number of other excellent research briefings you guys have produced at the TPA, kind of lift them off the shelf and say, you know, well, now is the time then. If you're serious about it, then, uh, you know, we've got, we've got the response and going for growth is necessary and reforming, simplifying and possibly lowering taxes is one of the key ways of getting there. Is that a window of opportunity for you guys? Yeah, without question. Uh, it's a shame that it's taken a public health emergency to get people to listen to stuff like that, uh, politicians in particular. But um, I think it's an absolute, absolutely is an opportunity. I think Tom's right. I think um, 
people might start seeing economic growth not as this um you know neutral thing that simply happens or on the on the left see it as, as an inherently bad thing that we need to stop i think you know groups like the new economics foundation think that economic growth is fundamentally bad so um some of those basics you know the profit motive you know people making profits again i think people have seen the stark reality of what happens when that doesn't happen um so we can actually start to have these conversations again and it will drastically simplify a tax system um, would be huge boon for investment, as, as Tom rightly said, and, and therefore growth. Um, obviously, other options, people were talking about, uh, you know, sort of high single digit uh, figure inflation, still inflating the debt away, but it has to be growth. And the other reason I'd be optimistic, and I've been burnt by this before, but um, the, the occupant of number 11 does seem to agree that growth is inherently a good thing. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm quite optimistic that uh, we'll have people in government, uh, not just uh, Rishi Sunak himself, but advisors around him that are willing to listen to these kind of arguments because it is the, you know, as you say, go for growth. It has to be the mantra. Uh, Rishi Sunak is very sound, as you say. He is a staunch supporter of Southampton FC, like all of the best market <laughs> liberals in the United Kingdom. Uh, so scores on a number of, uh, gets a number of ticks in his box. Christian, I want to come back to you. You were interested in what you're saying about re the reciprocal element. Um, uh, you were being perhaps less pessimistic than you have been at times over recent years. You think that something good might come of this. Do you think a narrative that those of us of a market liberal sentiment can can tell about this crisis, a story we can tell, a true story, uh, is actually the way, and it goes to what John was saying, the way that profit-making companies have responded has been pretty efficient. Uh, you know, I mean, toilet rolls were scarce for about all of about 24 hours, uh, but the supermarket shelves pretty much have everything on them that you could ever want. You wouldn't really know there's much of a crisis on by the produce on the shelves, that the profit-making private side of the economy seems to have adapted fantastically well. The sort of software that we're you know, holding these conferences on, I mean, brilliant. The IA has been able to maintain an events program, whereas the public sector side of the economy, well, a bit more tricky. It's been difficult to work out exactly how to centrally plan the right number of ventilators or to get the right PPE uh, into each and every hospital and it goes missing or it's still held up in Turkey. Do you think there could be a compare and contrast, not just between countries that we were talking about earlier, but between how the private side, the entrepreneurial side of the economy has weathered the storm and produced real value against the difficulties that the central planning public sector side has run into? I hope so, because that would absolutely be a correct narrative. I remember when, when this started, lots of people were posting pictures of uh, empty supermarket shelves on social media saying, well, there's your capitalism. Uh, you're telling us this only happens under socialism, but there we are. But then, as you said, it only lasted for a couple of days, and this very quickly disappeared, and the same people then went strangely quiet about it. And there have also been responses across the board that uh, places... Uh, that were once open to the public, suddenly becoming, um, shifting their activities to takeaway or just something that doesn't need physical interactions. And you had all sorts of reallocations going on spontaneously across the economy. You had well, one of my favorite examples is BrewDog, the brewery, uh, suddenly starting to make hand sanitizer, not something you would naturally think has huge economies of scope. But once you think about it, it makes sense. Hand sanitizer is mostly alcohol. So why shouldn't a brewery uh, be, be good at making that as well? And uh, even where the anti-market, anti-globalizers have a bit of a point on the supply, uh, the, the international supply chains issue. Well, yes, but even that hasn't been such a big problem. It, it was a bit in the beginning. If you had a company that was heavily invested in, in Wuhan and around it, that uh, that would cause some delays. But even that has been relatively minimal. Even international supply chains haven't really been the problem. To the extent that we've had an economic downturn or that we currently have an economic downturn, uh, this is really the lockdown itself. And... Um, plus the voluntary lockdown that, that we will still, the, the behavioral changes that we will still see once the restrictions are lifted. But this is clearly about economic activity that's happening here in the country. That is where we see the disruption. And uh, that with with the best will in the world, you couldn't uh, call this a market failure. We've, we've seen very quick responses across the board in the private sector. And you can, you can make a, a positive narrative out of this. 
And and John, before I let you and Christian go, your your thoughts on that? Do you think in this these bleak times, uh, those of us of a market disposition can actually point at real things, you know, full supermarket shelves, and show that actually the entrepreneurial side of the economy uh, rose to the challenge more easily than the slightly more lumbering, uh, monolithic public sector? Well, indeed, and public health England are sort of exhibit A of um, state failure. Um, not getting testing done uh, in any way quickly enough with their command and control um, uh, sort of approach to things. But it speaks to a, war, uh, a wider sort of malaise in the Quango um, sector, sphere, whatever you want to call it, where these bodies are unaccountable. They, um, you know, they tend to hire from within establishment circles. So um, all of these things that people maybe on the centre right have argued about over the last few years, like public appointments being skewed towards the left, um, they're, they're, they're more than just sort of these sort of whiny little arguments now. They actually matter. These, these people are making decisions that are life and death, um, and they've not been particularly good at them. Um, and then you evidence that against what's happened in the private sector, and, it, and it's there to see. So um, I think what we need, though, um, it's all well and good, all of us saying it, we actually need some um, politicians, some MPs in Parliament making these points um, and making them uh, nice and clearly, getting that stuff into the media, because uh, we, of course, believe in this stuff and we do all the research and we make the case and all the rest of it. But um, we need champions in Parliament who are going to do exactly the same and hold up Sainsbury's, Tesco's and say, look, look at this compared to what happened with Public Health England. Um, and then, you know, as well as tax reform, um, uh, some reform of the structure of government as a result. Um, where's the accountability in the state sector for all of these wrongdoings? Will anyone get sacked? Will anyone lose their jobs? Uh, no, probably not. They'll continue to get paid. They'll continue to get gold-plated public sector pensions. And John, just before I let you go, what's your optimism score out of 10? Um, six because I think uh, we'll, we'll have a big state for many years to come on the economy, so on, on, on the fiscal side. Um, but we, we were talking before about, uh, you know, uh, it was Christian talking about reciprocity when it came to people's social distancing. And I, I agree with Christian. I actually think that when lockdown eases, that people will be, um, they'll quickly reverse. And I think there's been a healthy skepticism of overreaching by the police as well, which has been good to see. And, and Christian, before I say goodbye to you as well, what's your score out of 10? I can't bring myself to go above 5 out of 10, but uh, I, oh, I right. think I would, have, I, I would have said that anyway, with or without a coronavirus. Okay. <laughs> well, that's good news. For once, um, England beat Germany 6-5 on penalties then, if you're only going for a 5. <laughs> um, Christian and John, thank you very much for joining us, gentlemen. Thank I'll you. see you both very soon. Yes. Keep up the great work. Uh, Tom, let me come back to you because one of the points we've been discussing earlier in the programme was uh, not just the sort of the, the uh, nuts and bolts economics of it, but the um, social sort of element of it as well. And there's some suggestions in the live chat in YouTube that, uh, and this goes a bit to what I was saying about the Swedish experience, you can lift the restrictions, but people might not play ball. One of the suggestions was, actually, if you reopen the schools again, you might actually divide society. A lot, a lot of parents would say, great, I can get the kids back to school. But others would say, no, I don't want the kids to go back to school. I'm still too worried they'll spread the virus or catch the virus. Uh, how much do you think we've now become socially inured to this sort of uh, to liberalism? And almost if we lift all the restrictions, everybody will just keep practicing them out of fear. I mean, honestly, that's such a hard question to answer because, I mean, there's there's no doubt that there will be some lingering effects in terms of changed attitudes and sort of dip, people having different views of their futures, maybe, than they had before. Um, you know, on the other hand, I, I've, I've been burned in the past by thinking, wow, this changes everything. You know, they're, they're, we're going to see sweeping change as a result of this, this incident, thinking of the financial crisis, say. Um, and actually, the, there's a strong tendency, um, you know, to, to revert to the mean after this sort of thing. So, uh, you know, I honestly don't know. I can't really predict the future. Um, now, I think that people who have been very pessimistic, and I've seen, you know, um, so the economist John Cochran, I think, um, has been one of the, the most interesting, stimulating commentators on this whole um, crisis on his blog, Grumpy Economist. But he's pretty pessimistic, and he talked about, I think, the the 50% economy or something like that. Um, but things will never go back to the way they were and we'll be, we'll be lingering in this sort of post-crisis malaise for years to come. And now that's possible. Um, but actually, I think that the changes will be 
more subtle than that. Um, I mean, I think that there's a chance that people say around my sort of age group and stage in life, um, married with children on the way, might suddenly think, oh, you know, the, the suburbs. We, we didn't like that idea, but it seems more appealing now. Mm -hmm. Stress to my wife, that's not my view. But I can see that being quite widespread. Um, the detached house and the white picket fence and driving everywhere instead of taking the tube becomes a little bit more appealing. But by and large, you know, I think people will start going back to work. They'll start going back to school. They'll start hanging out in crowded bars and nightclubs again eventually. Um, okay. I don't think everything's going to change. Matt, I'll bring you back in in a minute, but let me just uh, quickly introduce our um, final uh, uh, two, uh, two guests. Uh, delighted to be joined by Ollie Wiseman. He's the United States editor of the new magazine, The Critic. Um, before joining The Critic, Ollie was the editor of CapEx and the political editor of Standpoint magazine. Uh, we'll put up a link in, in YouTube on his latest work on how the virus has affected uh, America. Ollie, a very warm welcome to you. Uh, and uh, Chris Snowden, the IEA's very own Chris Snowden, he's our head of lifestyle economics at the Institute of Economic Affairs. Uh, he describes his work as, as focusing on pleasure, prohibition, and dodgy statistics. We'll get into some of those uh, very shortly. Uh, and Chris's latest report, Liberty After the Lockdown, uh, can be found on our website. And again, we'll make sure that we um, uh, post a link to that. Uh, and um, um, to Chris's own private blog, Velvet Glove Iron Fist, uh, in the YouTube live chat stream. So welcome to you both, gentlemen, Oliver and Chris. Really good to have you. Um, Oliver, we haven't touched too much on the US experience today. I've just been um, making people feel very, very miserable about the UK experience in comparison to some of our uh, European countries. Um, how's, how are things going in the US, potentially as badly or worse as they are in the, the UK, no? Uh, yeah, uh, well, firstly, nice to, be, nice to be with you all. And um, I think that you can actually have reason to be slightly gloomier, uh, even gloomier here in, here in America. Um, uh, not that I'm going to make any predictions about, about per capita, you know, death tolls or anything like that. But um, as I think was as hinted at earlier, we have two very different experiences. So in, in New York, it really, where, where there was a really, really terrible outbreak, it really does look like the worst is behind them. And, um, you know, things are, things are slowly but surely getting better. Um, the rest of America, it's a very uneven picture. And I think a lot of America, including where I am in D.C., um, you know, we're still, we're, we're still marching up that curve um, slowly because we're, uh, you know, we've successfully flattened that curve. But, but um, so this is the old thing where we're sort of talking about easing, easing things up when, when actually we're, we're still sort of, we're still sort of haven't, probably haven't reached our peaks yet. Mm -hmm. uh, and Matt, sorry, it's a while since I've brought you in. You mentioned the um, ASI's recent report, which uh, we can link again to in the uh, live chat on YouTube. Uh, but uh, I've asked a number of our other panelists where else they're looking at in the world that they think might get a thumbs up or a thumbs down. Uh, you mentioned that uh, the uh, some uh, inspiration from Israel in, in terms of your report. But what give us a, a very sh a briefly your sort of survey of what's going right or wrong elsewhere? Which are the countries we should be looking to and say let's do a bit more of that, and which countries should we be looking to and saying let's not go down that path at all? A lot of it depends on what the actual outcome you want. Right, so um, North uh, New Zealand and Australia have effectively decided to go for a no cases spread strategy. So they are aiming for no cases internally, and then they're going to open up each other, their economy to each other, um, and and also internally because Australia has a, a state uh, borders. Um, that's exactly the same as how South Korea is going for, and what Taiwan's going for, and Hong Kong's going for, um, and therefore the bounce back is much more obvious and noticeable in those countries. So Hong Kong's beaches are full, the restaurants are full, it feels like a normal day. Um, the UK isn't at that point yet, and if you own lockdown now, you end up with a slow spread, especially if you don't have testing, and you don't have tracking and, test and tracing, and you don't have anything effective, at least in those. Um, you'll end up with a flare-up again of the disease. Um, and that will be the same across Europe as well. If you don't control your borders, if you don't have quarantine, if you don't have so, and so on, then normal people, most normal people can't get back to their normal everyday lives. So um, various countries are doing relatively well, depending on what it is their outcome is. So you could say Sweden, if it's going for a spread, is doing relatively well because it's keeping its economy open whilst the spread is happening. 
um, like Germany has done very well in part of different regions because it's been set decentralized and it's able to, to, as Christian said, have a different strategy in Berlin than it does in Baden-Württemberg. Um, New Zealand has done very well in having no cases at all and therefore now being able to reopen and similarly Hong Kong because even though it's mm-hmm. a dense city it has a lots and lots of economic activity starting again but if it if we if they want to reopen to the world they can't do that because they have no spread uh, they yep. have no cases so they are very much in a bubble um, and that will make them poorer as well because they won't be able to reopen and and so Every country right now, this is like where we're like, oh yeah, can we can we internationally compare? Well, no, not yet. You can only really internationally compare in a year or two years time. Um, once you see whether there are second flare-ups, once you see whether there are mass deaths um, across the rest of the world or not. Uh, Chris, uh, let me bring uh, you in. Uh, good to see you again, Chris. Uh, we've been talking about these issues, you and I, uh, on and off over recent days. Uh, tell us a little bit about your recent IEA briefing paper, uh, Liberty After Lockdown, and if you like, the worries that you've raised that uh, various parts of this pandemic might actually end up being kind of romanticized to justify the retention of pretty authoritarian measures over the longer term. Yeah, I mean, the the briefing paper really just explains what the law says you can do. A lot of people assumed when we were seeing all these pictures of the police hassling people on park benches that the police were just overreaching enormously. Uh, And they weren't, if anything. The police have generally, I mean, there have been a few exceptions, but generally speaking, they've actually um, not gone as far as they could go. The, The laws are incredibly draconian. I don't think there's any real historical precedent for them in this country, including during war times. You know, we've never closed the pubs before. We've never closed the churches before. Um, and the other argument I guess I was making was, uh, yeah, we need to be very careful that none of these laws are kept in place for a, a second longer than they need to be. Uh, and finally, the possibility, which I, I think is very real, that once this is, once this is all a memory, uh, people will start looking back with a certain amount of nostalgia, some of which will be fairly harmless, kind of blitz spirit stuff about how people try to help each other out. And there was a sense of um, you know, in, being in it together. But also s- some other people, particularly from single issue pressure groups, particularly in public health and environmentalism, will be saying, wasn't it wonderful that we could hear the birds singing in the morning so clearly? And wasn't it wonderful that there was hardly any traffic? Um, and there was a reduction in crime and there were people in the street beating each other up. And perhaps we can learn some lessons and maybe we should keep hold of a little bit of this. To give you an example, proving my point, really, um, I've just found out today that a researcher up at the University of Stirling, who's quite well known for being anti-alcohol, has just got a load of taxpayers' cash to look into the effect of the coronavirus uh, restrictions on alcohol licensing and see how that affected A&E attendances. And I think we can predict that A&E attendances went down because they've gone down across the board for everything. And I think we can also predict that the conclusion will say, wouldn't it be nice to at least keep some of those licensing restrictions in place? Okay, that's interesting, Chris. I want to bring uh, Oliver back in because uh, I was speaking uh, to uh, some friends of mine in um, Washington today, uh, and they were suggesting, Chris is suggesting this might now be happening in Britain, if you like, the the pandemic's getting politicised. But is that happening in America, that this is now a kind of partisan issue about what you think of lockdown or not, or the science or not. People are taking a view on the science based on whether they're on the red team or the blue team, rather than on the objective facts in front of them. And could you tell us a little about how that's affecting uh, American politics? I mean, we got our general election here out of the way in December. Um, I don't know how on earth in America the Democrats or Republicans are going to hold their conventions this summer or what this means for the presidential race. But how is it affecting American political debate, public discourse, partisan politics and the potential outcome of the November election? Well, when the, when the, when the virus first arrived, there was some speculation that um, maybe you know we can finally stress test the limits of American partisanship and maybe a global pandemic from overseas is, will, will finally do for kind of red team, blue team thinking. And uh, I think it's, it's been long enough now to say that that has not come to pass and that there is, a, you know, partisanship is alive and well in America. Um, but then as with sort of most things um, to do with American political partisanship, 
I think that the um, the kind of noise, uh, the sort of very partisan noise, sort of hides quite a lot of detail, which suggests things are kind of not quite so, you know, the, the real world consequences of that partisanship are, perhaps aren't quite as serious as some would, would have you believe. So, you know, for example, um, the state's reopening thing, um, there's some, there's, there's a sort of slight red, red blue divide there, but there are some blue states that are reopening. Um, you could say in their defense, they've got a better case for reopening than the red ones that have. Um, but, 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 but equally on Trump, you know, the white house guidelines on, on, on when you should reopen as a state are comparable to the, um, to the guidelines to the, to the government in the UK's approach in terms of, in terms of what they're looking for. Um, and Trump manages to pull off this amazing thing of, Kind of being on both sides of an issue at, at once, so he can he can say these are the these are the White House guidelines, and they're taking it seriously, whilst also sort of cheering on the protesters against his own government's policy, uh, and somehow manages to do that, which um, um, is quite a political talent. Um, uh, in, in, in terms of the in terms of the election, I think um, you know the main thing is obviously the economic consequences of it, and I think that the Trump team are sort of reckoning with the fact that. This V-shaped recovery that they that they pinned a lot of hope on is is not um, going to come to pass, um, and so I think their pitch will be um, the economy took 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 this blow. It was out of our hands, you know. Not unreasonably, they will say it was out of our hands, and um, it looks like we're on the way back to prosperity. But you know, you can only trust. There's only one party to trust to, to deliver that prosperity. Um, the other th sort of thing that's less of a, slowly becoming more of an issue that I think will will get more interesting is is China, um, uh, and the role that plays in in domestic politics. There's been a ma I mean I think the same is true in Britain, but there's been a massive hardening of opinion against yeah. China, um, and you know Trump's problem with China started out as a trade thing, and in a way I think he sort of got lucky in the way global events have moved to, and he's been able to sort of pivot to make a broader point about, about China and, and sort of start this new cold war rhetoric. Um, but, but, you know, there's a sort of Trump, there's a sort of Trump world attempt to, to paint Joe Biden as Beijing Biden. Um, it's not especially, um, you know, I'm not sure how effective it will be in the sense that Biden uh, was just sort of conventional, like most of his opinions sort of conventional DC views on China, some of which have aged quite badly. Um, so I think China, but I think China, if you were sort of making a case for, for Trump's re-election, China being an increasingly, you know, opinion hardening on China is something he has going for him. The thing that's going against him is, is sort of the sense which, you know, he has not got the bounce in, in opinion polling that other leaders have got around the world. Yeah, he had it very briefly and, um, the polls are a mixed picture, but, you know, there's, you know, he, he is taking some of the blame for, um, for the for the for his handling of this crisis, obviously it's very partisan, and but but that means small moves at the margin can 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 do a lot. So I think that you can sort of make both cases on 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 the election. I mean, the third thing, which maybe there isn't time for now, is there's also this question of just the mechanics of the election, right? And that's in an already very partisan and difficult scenario, um, a situation where you have to um, make changes to how elections are conducted. It's sort of quite a, quite a stressful and, and fraught yeah, thing, and, and, and no 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 side trusts the other to do that in an even handed way, right? Just right. A, just translation for our viewers who don't follow American politics in detail or America in detail, they drive on the l wrong side of the road, and they also ascribe the wrong colours to their political parties. So the red team are the Correct. party on the right of centre, and the blue team are the party on the on the left of centre. But Oliver, I just wanted to come back to you on uh, whether you think. Um, uh, President Trump and the administration have, uh, have made a bad fist of the pandemic. I mean, I've actually, for once in my life, got sympathy for politicians of all stripes in all countries, very difficult situation to deal with. But I'm I'm teasing my American friends by when I'm meeting them on Zoom by saying uh, that they're looking incredibly well. And is that because they've uh, injected debt holes straight into their veins or whether you're supposed to inject it straight into your eyeballs. I'm not quite sure what the prescribed way, but the Donald Trump is suggesting. The, the impression in the British media uh, is that he's having a complete disaster. Uh, mind you, the impression in the British media was that his last uh, presidential election campaign was a complete disaster and he emerged triumphant. Uh, is he being seen to sort of his slightly shoot from the hip, make it up as you go along might not be the right sort of attitude, tone or approach that Americans are looking for in this sort of situation? Yeah, I think I think that's right. I mean, I think there is, obviously there is a media tendency to 
to presume that he, what he's done is disastrous and how could he ever recover for this and from this and then he always somehow finds a way to but it, you know in, it's interestingly after after the sort of ridiculous death toll comments you know the, the the daily briefings at the white house stopped and advisors saw some polling and got very scared and trump saw some polling about old old voters not not really um uh, you know, no longer supporting him in the, in the numbers they did. So sort of decided that May was going to be old people month. You know, they, they definitely kind of are, um, they definitely have made many missteps politically. Uh, and I, I think you can kind of go too far down the road of saying, oh, Trump, this is why people like Trump. You know, that's true. But but I think that something as serious as this, um, you know, that's, that's not always the right tone, tone to strike. Um, on the actual substance of it, though, I would say, I think, um, you know the, the the noise around Trump hasn't. He's definitely failed to sort of provide the leadership, provide the strategy that that a, that a good president would provide at this time. Um, but also, I think that you know the reality is the governors have a lot of work to do. Some of them have done very well um, across the board, pretty much um, across the board, pretty much. Um, Americans are, are sort of prefer their state's response to the the federal government's response. So right. it's been quite a good advert for federalism. Um, which, depending on your views, is kind of a, a good thing, I guess. Um, but it, but it certainly is is worth bearing in mind when you're talking about Trump and coronavirus. You know, it's not just a question of one man versus a, a disease, much as much as he, contrary to what he might claim. Uh, Matt, let me bring you in. Uh, I asked you to sort of compare and contrast. What's your what's your view, uh, Matt, of how it's been uh, playing out in the states? Obviously, we shouldn't think of it as a monolithic country. I made the point earlier. You know, New York City and rural Wyoming are. A universe apart, but what's your impression been of the the way the Trump administration has handled this? Um, I thought it was really interesting listening to various uh, conversations between the state governors and the central administration at the beginning of the crisis. I think the Californian governor saying, uh, giving praise rather um, amazingly to Donald Trump and the White House at the beginning of the crisis when he was saying every ask we'd asked for has been done by the White House. Um, we, we saw a bit more of an antagonism between uh, Cuomo and uh, Donald Trump in New York. Um, and that has been sort of, I think that that story has played out because of the fact that the crisis has been so much worse in New York. But we'd expect it to be worse in New York. It's a dense city, international travel hub. It didn't take the measures to lock down uh, very quickly at all. In fact, there were, you know, I, I think there's a, there's a, a big um, chemsex party currently happening in New York, um, <laughs> which is being played out on social media. Um, so there are, and there's a bit of a sort of an American culture about rebellion, about remo- like not being told what to do by the state, about you know living life, enjoying it, um, and that plays out in big cities to a large degree. Um, and, and it did in London as well. You know, it was it was a long, it, it was an. There was a lot of people moving, of, of, of uh, shifting into not going into work, not taking unnecessary journeys, but there were a lot of people still at the pub um, mm-hmm. at the moment before the lockdown came in. Um, and, and so, and, and, and that is, you know, we did see infection right across the board um, from, from that moment. Um, the, I think America hasn't done a great job. It hasn't shown itself to have lots of state capacity. Um, various states have done various things differently. Uh, which is good. We see lots and lots of natural experiments. That's what America's federal system does have in its favour. Um, but we see that a bit, little bit in the in various European states as well. So, uh, in terms of a score out of ten for America, um, it's it's a it's a four for me. I'm afraid. Four and Tom, you uh, previously a research uh, scholar at the Cato Institute, um, good good allies and friends of ours in Washington. DC now back on this side of the pond. What's your impression now, looking at it from afar rather than up close about the administration's uh, behaviour? Yeah, it, it's a tricky one. I mean, I think to a certain extent, um, many of us, even if we haven't approved of all of Donald Trump's policies and decisions, have kind of enjoyed um, enjoyed watching him from afar. Uh, and drawn great amusement from some of the twists and turns of his administration. Um, I do think, unfortunately, a joke stops being funny um, in the middle of a pandemic. Um, And certainly, uh, the US federal response has not been, I think, everything that it should be. Um, But at the same time, you know, it's, it's quite common in America 
and it's incredibly common in Europe and Britain to focus on the president as, you know, this, this is the embodiment of all US government. And other people have already said it, that is not the case at all. It becomes very, very clear when you work in the US. Whoever's president, whatever his qualities or failings, um, there are usually people with enormous qualities throughout administrations in Congress, in, in state governments and so on. Um, and so while I think that there, I mean, clearly the response has been lacking, there's no getting around that. And um, some of the messaging has been bizarre at best. Um, one of the great things about America is that sort of 50 states, um, the experiments in democracy, and also, of course, the incredible robustness and innovation that's embodied in the American corporate sector. Um, and, you know, one thing I think that should be all of our hopes um, is that the U.S. economy can bounce back um, because it's still, for, for all of the, the globalization and rebalancing that's happened, um, the U.S. economy still drives global growth to a great degree. Um, it's still responsible for an enormous amount of the innovation and entrepreneurship um, that the rest of you know the rest of the world can then follow in the stream of. Um, so I think we've got to hope um, that that all turns out well. And it's not just Trump. You know, there are lots of great people involved in in American government. Uh, Chris, I want to come back to you to uh, talk a little bit more about your recent report, one statistic which uh, you helped me dig out, which I then used in my Times article uh, earlier this week, in terms of potential uh, benefits, perceived side benefits, if you like, of the pandemic. But one that was just jaw-dropping for me, but I wonder whether you think this might completely change public debate, was that the IEA, not ourselves, the International uh, Energy Agency, not the Institute of Economic Affairs, has predicted that uh, CO2 emissions across the planet in 2020 will fall by, wait for this, 8%. If that is, this is the scale of global economic lockdown and putting the entire global economy into the deep freeze reduces CO2 emissions by 8%. What sort of lockdown or change of conditions would be required to get anywhere close to Greta Thunberg and Extinction Rebellion's target of net zero by 2030. Do you think that could blow, for example, the more extreme environmentalist movement out of the water just as being utter fantasy? Well, it's certainly a good, um, a good argument to make, and it's a good, good example to use, I think. Um, yeah, it is extraordinary. I, I gather that in the UK, the emissions are going to go down by um, uh, quite a bit more than that. But yeah, globally, it's it's astonishing, really, isn't it? It's astonishing when you consider how few people are on the roads and presumably uh, how much heavy industry must have declined with the lock-ins. Um, yeah, it shows that it's totally undoable with existing technology. I mean, it shows that it's going to be pretty difficult, obviously, <laughs> with some extremely good technology. And the whole net zero thing does depend on technology that hasn't been invented yet. You know, it's only a and a prayer, really. Um, but if there is you know, huge improvements in, in battery um, uh, battery storage and carbon capture, then, yeah, in theory, we could probably do that. But if you look at the things that need to be done, it's, it's, it's astonishing. Chris, can you just turn your microphone down a bit? We were getting a I'm little sorry. bit of interference, uh, uh, interference there. Uh, so it is pretty astonishing. Uh, uh, Oliver, do you think that a consequence of the pandemic might be to, to change some elements of political discourse, that some things that were entertained pre-pandemic might not be afterwards, that there might just be a change of priorities. Do you think that some of those asking for carbon net zero by 2030 might be proven to have been just, you know, now completely out of reach? Uh, well, I think I have some general um, thoughts on that, which is uh, if you think a lot of what, a lot of, sort of the, the less edifying end of, the, of political debate, sort of silly culture war out and stuff, um, that we've had to endure recently are kind of a consequence of our kind of sort of relative affluence and coziness of of our existences. And you know, maybe there's some hope that that, that something like this is a serves a sort of as a sort of wake up call in which I mean that on both sides of various debates, but a sort of reminder, especially in a generational sense, maybe to younger younger people. Um, you know, this is what this is what politics is really about. It's about figuring out how to deliver. Uh, you know how to guard against big threats, how to how to deliver high standards of living, uh, and so on. And I think that that's certainly from a sort of pro market point of view, that should be the the way of thinking about the opportunity presented by this. I will say just to sort of dissent from the panel slightly. I think it also could work the other way on climate change specifically. And 
and that the, the lots of people in that movement see this as a kind of a, a template to follow in terms of mixing kind of technological change being a sort of um, a vaccine plus us uh, us um, changing our behavior to kind of help get us there. I think that sort of maps quite nicely onto climate change. And I wouldn't be surprised if that's kind of, you see quite a lot of that um, point being made. Chris, let me come back to you. Let's hope your microphone's um, working a little better for the feed this time. Perhaps you could tell us a little, you, you're a prolific writer for us at the IA. You've got another paper coming out tomorrow about public health, uh, the public health authorities entitled False Economies, Myths About Public Health Spending. Talk us through the headlines of that, if you would, and then I'll ask our, our panelists to respond to some of your thoughts uh, and um, uh, and then also give me their optimism rating, and I'll work out the average for all of our panelists over the course of this discussion. So tell us a little, Chris, if you would, about the, the, the paper you've written that's coming out tomorrow, False Economies, Myths About Public Health Spending. That will be available on the IA website from tomorrow morning. Yes, indeed. How's my sound before I go that's on? That's a lot better. I don't Good. want to be that's too perfect. loud or too quiet. Okay. No, well, that's, you've got that's the Goldilocks level just now. right. Yeah. So, yeah, tomorrow I'm um, looking at uh, public health spending. Um, it's actually something I started writing before the pandemic, and then the, the coronavirus issue kind of made it more relevant, actually. There have been people who have been suggesting, reasonably you might say, that we would have uh, been better prepared for tackling this um, if the public health budget or the NHS budget had been bigger. And in a trivial sense, that's true, because you can always imagine that had the NHS got an extra billion pounds, it would have spent it all on ventilators and face masks. The reality is it probably wouldn't have done. Um, and public health spending in particular, um, in terms of public health England, uh, the the amount that it's spending specifically on the prevention of infectious diseases of this kind has actually gone up quite significantly over the years. Um, one thing I would say, you might not be surprised to hear this, is that if it's spent a bit less money on all the nanny state uh, lifestyle regulation and paternalism, it might be a bit better prepared for the uh, pandemic. But it is certainly the case that, you know, you know, we really, I don't understand why we haven't had face masks, for example. These are not things that go out of date quickly. They're used in the NHS anyway. You can keep replenishing the stock. Um, so, yeah, I think that we have been let down. I think the public health response has been uh, pretty poor, but you can't blame that on underfunding. It's a matter of how you decide to apportion the budget that you've got. Sorry, a bit of interference on my screen there. Um, uh, the One of our YouTube comments says, uh, uh, tongue-in-cheek, I think, we should ban alcohol and driving. That will save a lot of lives. And being overweight dangerous sports, skiing, skydiving, they're all preventable killers. Um, Tom, let me ask you, do you think we might see uh, a recalibration of the public health debate um, that um, we you know, shouldn't be spending as much time worrying about what warning labels there are on a wrapper of confectionery? We should be spending all of the resources worrying about where the next pandemic might come from. Yeah, um, I think you're right. I think there's bound to be a day of reckoning for Public Health England after this. Um, look, probably for most of us, this is the first real public health crisis we've ever experienced. And yet for the last, I don't know, 10 years, we've heard endlessly about public health this, public health that. But frankly, they've all been private healthy. It's been about how much do you drink? How much do you smoke? Are you consuming too much salt or sugar? Um, and now, look, I've, I've got no doubt there are probably some fantastic people specialising in infectious diseases working at Public Health England. Um, but you do wonder about um, sort of organisational priorities and structures um, when all we've heard from these guys for years is about fat children or, you know, smokers. Um, and has that drawn away the focus from the stuff that we really want public health authorities uh, to do? Uh, you know, ultimately, infectious disease and control thereof this is one of the few really core uh, functions of government. Um, how, probably however libertarian, classical, liberal you are, this is something that you have a government to deal with. Um, and, you know, we haven't had the worst response in the world. We certainly haven't had the best. I mean, certainly there are some big decisions that I think they whiffed early on. Um, and so maybe you break that organisation up. Maybe you have some really top people focusing on the stuff you really want them to focus on make sure this kind of thing doesn't happen yep. again. Um, and ideally, let's forget the rest. 
<laughs> Matt, what are your thoughts on that? Can we get away from sort of the trivial micromanagement nanny state stuff and, and try and reconfigure our public health agencies onto, you know, where the next, you know, pandemic caused by a bat in a wet market is going to come from? I mean, I wish, Mark, I wish. Uh, but we've already seen uh, the public health lobby um, on various parts of the BBC and Sky making the case that that they're anemically funded, that they don't have enough power and control, that they're, they're, they're being hard done by by the media at the moment because everyone's blaming them, um, that, you know, that the cuts and austerity have been, have been dreadful for them. Their budget has not gone down. Year on year, it's increased that they're actually, that they've got a four billion pound budget um, staff right across the UK. Uh, they they only spend six hundred million of their four billion pound budget on vaccines. They spend spend two and a half billion on telling you, forcing companies that uh, you know to for, to reformulate their drinks, making my fizzy drinks awful um, and my chocolate. Truly so you'd like to see it go this way, but you're not hopeful. You don't. Oh, think... not even the slightest. And until you've got to the grips with that funding issue, with the fact mm-hmm. that they're able to lobby for that, they were able to use a level of authority um, to create their own sort of like spiral of of, of virtue funding, um, and that so they keep pushing it up, and they keep creating spurious stories, and they keep creating fake successes. Um, and also, you know, saying that the public has failed them by not losing weight, so they need to be spent more money on this particular thing. Um, we're not going to see that change at all. Um, I wish it were the case. I think Chris would wishes it were the case, although maybe he'd have to get a different job uh, <laughs> if that happened. Uh, but no, I'm not hopeful at all. Okay, well, uh, I just uh, we've got to bring uh, proceedings to a close, gents. So I just want to go round the houses and ask you, as I've asked our previous panelists. How optimistic are you on a scale of one to 10 about the outcome over about the next two or three years? So not the next two or three weeks or the next two or three generations, but the next two or three years uh, about prosperity, liberty and freedom returning. One is you think we're all going to become North Korea. Ten is uh, liberal free market utopia is within our grasp. Uh, Oliver, let me start with you. Where are you on the one to 10 scale? Uh, I'm pretty optimistic. I'm probably that says more about me than the facts of the case, probably. But um, I reckon I'm a I'm a seven or an eight. I'll go seven. I'll go seven. Uh, I think that we're probably in for in the US a bit more short and medium term discomfort, both lockdown wise and economically than most people think. But I think in terms of how this changes everything, I don't think it's nearly as as gloomy from 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 our point of view as as, as some would think. Tom, going to say six point five. Not a lot different than I would have said before, maybe slightly lower. Um, but, you know, uh, I, I, we're not going to bounce back right away, but I think we can bounce back strongly next year. I think there are some hopes for good policies. You've given a 0.5 just to make the average mathematics harder for me, haven't you? That was the rationale <laughs> behind that. Uh, um, uh, it's all right. I'm going to be dividing by 10, so it shouldn't be that difficult, really. Uh, Matt, uh, what's your number, level of optimism out of 10? Uh, fundamentals of freedom are still in our favour. Uh, the West is still best and politicians have come around to that fact. And also conservatives have come around to the fact that the divide is between one nation as and free marketeers again. And that is in our favour um, because the ideas are coming from the free market side. Um, I'm going to give a healthy eight. Wow. OK, that's pretty good. No one scored higher than an eight yet. Chris, you're pretty curmudgeonly. You're not going to score higher than an eight. What's what's your number, sir, to round off the evening? Mine, I should say, was a four. Oh, really? Uh, but, yeah. Oh, well, you're, you're 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 more pessimistic than me. Then I'm going to say I was was going to say seven, but to make it easy for you, I'll say seven and a half. Right. Um, and that is because something tells me in my being that this current crisis will end more quickly than people think it will. I don't know why. I don't know whether it might turn out that there's a lot more people who've already had it and got the antibodies than we think, or more likely that human ingenuity will just find a a cure for it. Um, But I I don't think we're in this for quite as a long haul as uh, people currently think. I'm still very pessimistic about the next six months, by the way, particularly with the government trying to do this contact tracing app, which I'm it has all the hallmarks of another massive government IT fiasco. But in the long term, two or three years, seven and a half, which is still down from what I would have said a few months ago. Okay, so I think I've got the maths right here. I'll come to that after I've um, thanked all of our panelists. And just a few extra plugs for those of you 
watching us uh, on YouTube. Uh, remember again to hit subscribe so uh, and the notification bell so you get uh, notifications of all of our upcoming online content and webinars. Uh, we actually have an online webinar uh, tomorrow at 5 p.m. That's 5 p.m. Uh, UK British Summer Time on COVID-19 views from across the pond, where I'll be joined by Dr. Tom Palmer, Ryan Bourne, and Joe Lehman, three leading think tankers uh, on the other side of the pond, to explain uh, in uh, to follow up really a good number of the points that Oliver was raising about the way things have been handled in the states and what we might expect next. Um, also, do go to the IEA's website, iea.org.uk. You can sign up there for our IEA uh, daily email newsletter for free, or you can join our book club. Uh, if you're minded to donate, we re re rely on donations in order to keep these uh, sort of broadcasts running and free for anyone in the world to watch and participate in. Please do make a donation, however modest, though always greatly appreciated. Um, finally, my thanks to all of our panelists today. I hope I haven't missed anybody here. Kate, Sam, Tom, John, Christian, Matt, Tom, Ollie and Chris. Been fantastic to have your company this evening. The total out of all 10 of us, I added my four in to make it easy to divide by 10. I'm not very good at dividing by nine, was 65 out of 100. So an average of six and a half. I said at the outset that everything was pretty depressing. But, you know, that's on the fair side of average. Six and a half, not too bad. Some reasons to be cheerful. Gents, thanks very much for joining us this evening. Thanks to all of you who are watching on YouTube. Stay safe. Have a very good night. See you soon.